Hi everyone, welcome to my talk on blockopolymer mycelization of DNA nanostructures. My name is Thorsten Schmidt. I'm an assistant professor for experimental biophysics in the physics department at Kent State University in Ohio. The first topic that I want to talk about today um, was a collaboration um, between um, Kensuke Osaka, um, who was at Tokyo University at that point, and my student Nayan, who is now a postdoc at um, MIT. And here we want to present a work that was published in uh, Angewandte Chemie, which is the blockopolymer mycelization as a protection strategy for DNA origami. And um, this is all in the context of nanomedicines. So nanomedicines have a couple of advantages over um, co more conventional medicines. So if you look at small molecules, they may not be soluble in uh, water very easily. They may be cleared um, through your kidneys very uh, easily. They often work unspecifically and often are also immunogenic. On the other hand, um, nanomedicines have gained a lot of attention in the last years and also through um, some of the vaccines that are out there. Um, so they protect the cargo much better. They make it uh, soluble in water. Um, they ensure a longer circulation time. Um, and they can also be more specific or less immunogenic. So the perfect nanomedicine that you could think of um, is something like you can see in this um, image here, which is a still from a movie from the 1960s. And in this movie, scientists and this submarine here were shrunk to micrometer dimensions and were injected into the vein um, of a patient to dissolve a blood cloth in this uh, patient's brain. So this is a very specific nanomedicine. It's very intelligent and smart. It's operated by the scientists and it has a very powerful 1960s laser um, that then blasts this um, blood cloth in that um, poor person's brain. So that is our gold standard, um, but unfortunately we are not there yet. But you can make pretty smart um, nano devices out of DNA and we are using the DNA origami technique where you start with the genome of the M13 bacteriophage, which happens to have a single-stranded genome, and then you fold this um, in a computer program into arbitrary shapes. And then this program helps you to design something like 200 synthetic oligonucleotides that you then can add together. Um, and all these sequences are designed such that they stabilize um, these loops with one another in the design shape. And this could, for example, be the upper arm of a five-point star. Um, this is a real AFM image, and you can also construct virtually any other two-dimensional shape. Or you can also make three-dimensional structures by layering um, many of these structures um, on top of another. And all these structures here were um, designed and synthesized in William Shee's lab. In my lab, we have um, built some more material efficient structures, um, hollow wireframe structures with these triangulated motifs, um, which you can roll up and build tubes with different um, cross sections. Um, so you can look up these papers if you're interested in more details. Um, but everyone who sees these structures for the first time eventually starts to ask, well, pretty nice, but who cares? What can you do with these structures? So they become really useful when you um, realize that these are fully anisotropic nanoparticles. So as the structure of this M13 um, bacteriophage genome is non-repetitive, um, means that all these oligonucleotide sequences here are also unique and you can address every position here in a, such a large um, three-dimensional structure or two-dimensional structure with nanometer precision. And when you then um, label some of these oligonucleotides with small biomolecules or fluorophores, other chemical modifications, or have single-stranded modifications um, sticking out there, uh, you can address all these positions with nanometer precision and define angles and so on. So, and with this Technology, you can also label these structures with gold nanoparticles, um, with antibodies and with fluorophores and so on, and create very 
um, sophisticated three-dimensional structure. So one of the most famous structures in, in the context of nanomedicine is the structure here built by my former colleague Sean Douglas, um, who built this um, clamp here, which can open and close, um, and which can recognize surface markers of cancer cells, then open up and then expose um, these antibody fragments that are localized in the center of this um, clamshell um, DNA um, robot here and kill the cancer cell. That sounds like science fiction too, doesn't it? And um, is this maybe uh, already the miniature version um, of this submarine here? Well, not quite yet. There's still a couple of hurdles in between. So one problem is that these um, DNA structures can be immunogenic, but also they degrade very quickly when they're exposed to some um, biological context. And this is what we wanted to address uh, in our project. So if you have such a um, three-dimensional DNA object here, it is negatively charged because DNA um, has all these phosphates. Um, and uh, if you now put this in a medium that does not shield these electrostatic interactions very well, that means it does not contain enough salt, um, such as um, blood um, or saliva or so, then all these electrostatic interactions um, will um, repel one another and will degrade the structure. But also in all biological fluids, including saliva and blood, there are nucleases. So these are enzymes that um, recognize DNA and um, chew it up and, and this way degrade DNA. Um, this problem was already recognized um, in the 1980s and 1990s in the context of um, non-viral gene therapy. And here people have um, developed a number of different polymers, and this is a polymer conference. And one of the polymers that you can use um, to shield DNA um, is a polyethylene glycol polylysine block copolymer, where in the positively charged polylysine then interacts with the negative charges on the DNA and builds this electrostatic interaction here. So they just really stick there. Um, and then the non-charged polyethylene glycol um, units um, will then build this protective shell um, around the DNA nanostructure. So in this project, we have used blockopolymers of different lengths. Um, so we have used um, lysine units, um, which were 10 to 20 lysines long. So that works pretty well. If you make them much longer, then you start to aggregate the DNA structures. Um, and the PEC units, um, they can um, be of, of different lengths. Um, you can find the details in our paper in Angewandte Chemie. And to test if this stabilization method works on DNA structures as well, we have designed and built um, three, uh, four different DNA structures, a 24 helix bundle, a long filamentous six helix bundle, a flat origami, and one of these triangulated trusses that I have shown you before. And all these scale bars are 100 nanometers. So this one here is a bit zoomed out. Um, and you can see how they look like um, in AFM or in TM images. Um, and if you then add the blockopolymer, you can see that the shape of these structures um, is maintained, which is very important to us because you don't want to compress these um, structures. Um, and you also can decomplex them by adding poly N ions um, such as um, uh, dextrin sulfate. And then we have um, exposed these DNA structures to different um, nucleases. So this is uh, DNAs1, a very um, potent exonuclease, um, to fetal bovine serum, which also has some exonuclease activity and low salt conditions. And we have seen in all cases that um, without any blockopolymer, so that is this minus here, um, you see a degradation um, of the structures. But if you do have the protective shell, the plus columns here, um, then all these structures survive and um, you can see the original shape that we have designed. We also wanted to test whether this approach is um, compatible with different functionalizations that are often used in DNA nanotechnology. 
One of the most common ones is functionalization with gold nanoparticles via a um, tile linker um, and a complementary DNA interaction here. And we have functionalized six helix bundles with these, uh, with four DNA uh, functionalized gold nanoparticles. Um, this is how the control looks like, and this is how the polyplexed structures look like. So you can see that also the gold nanoparticles, um, they are still attached. And we have done the same with um, quantum dots that are attached to the DNA structures by, um, by biotin streptavidin um, interactions here. So these are these dots here. So that's how the control looks like. Um, and we have, we have also shown that these complexes, when they are protected, they also withstand DNA's one um, degradation. So the take home message for this first part of this talk is that DNA structures, if they're not protected, are degraded very quickly by low salt conditions and by the presence of enzymes. Um, but if you are using this blocopolymer approach mm, that we have demonstrated here, that they can withstand all these conditions very efficiently. Um, and now we're working on some programmable mRNA delivery vehicles, also using this um, approach here. And um, we want to test if um, the size and shape and stiffness and these functionalizations, um, how they uh, determine the uptake and intracellular fate um, of these structures within cells. So far, I have mainly talked about applications of DNA origami in the direction of nanomedicine, so nanomedical applications. But there are also other applications of um, DNA origami in electronics and in photonics. Um, so in this work from our lab, we have demonstrated that we can assemble gold nanoparticles on a DNA origami scaffold uh, with a very defined and very close spacing um, and have shown that such structures here um, can propagate um, light in the form of plasmons through structures that are much smaller than the wavelength um, of the light itself. So here I don't want to talk about all the um, details of this. Um, here you can see a simulation, but we have also shown this experimentally. Um, so, but these ex uh, these um, applications here sometimes are not compatible with salt water. So, for example, if you want to um, use DNA for electronic applications, um, then obviously the computer chips that you may want to apply these to. Um, would not uh, want to be submerged in salt water. So for this reason, we want to apply the blocopolymer micellization approach um, in a different way. Um, so DNA is highly polar and it is negatively charged, as we have um, discussed before. Um, and as such, it is only um, typ typically only soluble in aqueous buffers. Um, but as we cover the DNA origami with blocopolymers, the outside of the blocopolymers here are polyethylene glycol um, chains, which are um, amphiphilic and both soluble in aqueous um, phase, but even better soluble in some organic solvents. And we hypothesized um, that we could initiate a, a, a phase transfer um, simply by adding blocopolymers to um, DNA origamis. And you could also re uh, revert this by adding poly anions. So as a proof of concept, we have started with gold nanoparticles, which are densely covered with single-stranded um, oligonucleotides. So we're using these for many applications in our lab. Um, and we thought these are um, very good test systems because they're visible with the naked eye. So these, this red color here is the plasmonic effect from these gold nanoparticles. Mm. And chemically, we hypothesize that these covered gold nanoparticles um, are very similar to DNA origami, which also has DNA on the outside. Um, so we started by layering some organic solvent, um, chloroform, um, which is denser than water, um, below the aqueous phase. And then we added a solution of the blockopolymers, shook this, and within seconds, um, the um, red color migrated into the organic phase, um, showing that this blockopolymer micellization of the gold nanoparticles indeed um, initiated a phase transfer, which was even um, almost complete. Um, we have 
repeated this experiment with different um, solvents. It works the best with chlorinated um, solvents. Um, and uh, it also works with miscible uh, solvents, as I'm going to um, show in a bit. We have repeated this experiment then with fluorescently labeled um, origamis and have investigated whether the origamis are found in the aqueous phase, in the interface between the aqueous and the um, organic phase, or in the chloroform phase. Um, and we have varied the n over p ratio, which is the um, ratio between the uh, ammonium groups of the polylysine um, and the phosphates in the DNA. So at an n over p um, of 1, you have just as many um, ammonium groups as phosphate groups. Um, and you can see that if you're increasing the amount of blockopolymers, the n over p ratio here, um, then more and more DNA origami is transferred from the aqueous phase into the organic phase um, and the optimal n over p ratio seems to be um, somewhere around um, 3. We have also investigated this transition into the organic phase with native agarose gels. Um, here you can see the control structure um, which uh, was a um, filamentous six helix bundle and um, if you don't have any glucopolymers, um, then it migrates um, towards the um, anode. And if you add the glucopolymers, then you have a screening of the charges and um, it even um, migrates a little bit into the other side. This is the well over here. So now in um, these different panels here, you can see different um, different solvents. Here we had chloroform. So if we do not have any blocopolymers, the DNA origamis are only found in the aqueous phase. Um, but then if you do add the blocopolymers, then the micelles are found exclusively in the organic phase and not in the aqueous phase anymore. Um, and you can also follow this in the other uh, solvents. Um, in the water miscible solvents, acetone and propanol, they mix with water so you don't get a phase separation. Um, you do find the um, DNA origamis in the supernatant and they don't form a pellet, which they usually did uh, would um, if you did not have the blockopolymers. Now, in some cases, it may be desirable to completely remove all water and um, also resuspend the DNA origami in a water miscible um, solvent. And this is how we did that. Um, so we first added the blocopolymers, transferred the DNA origamis into the chloroform phase, then removed the chloroform phase um, into a, um, a different tube, dried that, and then resuspended the um, DNA origami micelles um, in different solvents. So here we had um, different solvents, chloroform, dichloromethane, isopropanol, and acetone. And you can see they um, dissolve um, almost completely in most of these solvents. Isopropanol is um, not ideal, but it still works well enough. Um, and then you can, if you like, um, transfer this again into a different um, tube, um, dry it, and redissolve it in water. Um, and this is how we tested whether the um, structures survived all this drying and uh, phase transfer. And we could see this in the image. We also tested if this blocopolymer micellization and phase transfer is compatible with um, gold nanoparticles. So here you see an image of origamis with gold nanoparticles on them in the aqueous phase. Um, and there's almost no change if you have a look at the um, organic phase after we did all this um, phase transfer. Um, still 96% um, of the sites on these DNA origamis um, were occupied by gold nanoparticles even after these um, procedures. Um, we've also done this with quantum dots um, by biotin streptavidin interactions um, or with streptavidin itself. Um, so you can see this uh, in the um, TM images as uh, very faint shadows here in the negatively uh, stained um, structures. 
So this demonstrates that this blocopolymer micellization strategy not only protects DNA um, for biomedical applications, but also allows a phase transfer into organic solvents and removal of all uh, excess salts and uh, salt water and resuspending DNA origamis in dry solvents, which would be very um, useful in um, applications in sensing, in chemistry, and in electronics. So with this, I want to conclude my talk, um, but still want to advertise a position for a postdoc in my lab. Um, this is on a completely different um, topic. Um, in this work here, we're trying to build um, DNA-based lipid nanodisks. So this is a DNA ring around a lipid nanodisk here. And we want to build um, cryo-electron microscopy tools for membrane proteins. So we want to put membrane proteins into these disks and analyze them by single molecule cryo-electron microscopy. Um, so if you were um, a chemist with some nucleic acid chemistry background, or um, even have some uh, experience with um, membrane structural biology, then write me an email and um, maybe you can join my lab. With this, I want to thank all my fantastic lab members over the years. So this was the group um, in Dresden. Most of the work that I was showing today was done by Nayan, who is um, now a postdoc at MIT. This is the lab in Kent, um, a pre-pandemic photo. A couple of people have already left. Um, Yusuke is now a professor in Japan. Um, this was a collaboration um, mainly with Kensuke Osada in Tokyo. Funding came from all these sources. And finally, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you.